mentioned, when I reached out to you to um, co-host with me, and I mentioned the topic uh, medicalization, what came to your mind? Yeah, you know, when we talk about medicalization, it's can, for people who really understand and who have been to the fields, who have actually been able to, you know, interact and meet people that have undergone this process, this procedure, it's kind of heartbreaking. Why it's heartbreaking is because where you're seeing people who are supposed to be, you know, the saviors, people who are supposed to, you know, be at the front line of uh, trying to stop this, who are supposed to be the voice, you know, educating people and who are now the people actually perpetrating the act, you know, all for whatever reasons. And it makes it very difficult for those of us who have, who have sisters, who have mothers, who have friends, and who have met people who are battling with the consequences of this practice, you know, to campaign because no matter how you are able to shout in the, on, on media, these people have direct access to the health, these healthcare providers who also um, encourage them otherwise. So I really think that this is coming at a very great time where we need to add more voice and, and, and beautifully we're having doctors here who will also be adding our voices to say, this is not supposed to be so. I think it's a right time for us to also come from this angle because all this while we've been actually been talking from the cultural perspective, you know, from the rural areas and all that. But you know, a lot of people are beginning to move to the cities right now. And the cities is where we can actually find very qualified, you know, seasoned uh, healthcare providers who are supposed to also stay there to fight back and tell them, see, you can't run from the rural areas to the city to do the same thing because the consequences are the same whether you are in the moon, whether you are in the Jupiter, the consequences of female genital mutilation are very bad, so. Thank you very much, Raymond. What a detailed response. I mean, you're already lecturing us and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, medicalization is actually a deep one. I would like you to know that um, more than 25% of FGM cases in Nigeria were carried out medically. And um, those are some of the issues of retraction. So if you're joining us, thank you very much and welcome. So we have doctors here, just like um, Raymond has said. I was tempted to say Dr. Raymond has said. <laughs> Please, Dr. Raymond is welcome. <laughs> yeah, so just as Raymond has said, we have doctors here to share and make us understand what's happening. So um, our first speaker will be talking about Please, medical yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, um, defining the terms and then also making us understand um, why we are having this webinar, why some people think it is wrong. So um, without any bias, um, we'll be inviting Dr. Cosley to simplify the term medicalization and then what it means, you know, and then also how it relates to the medical profession. So thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Cosley, are you there? Dr. Cosley, are there with me? Hello, Dr. Cookley, are you there? Okay, yes, I'm here. I have the floor, nice to have you, welcome. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me quickly take a minute to thank um, the Global Media Campaign, uh, I mean, both the Global Team and then the Nigeria Team for having me, I want to thank the partners as well, the You're welcome for supporting this very important conversation. Okay, so um, costly, and um, I'm told to speak on medicalization, the medical profession and medicalization of FTM, the definition, um, mode of operation, and then the sanctions. So, um, okay, since I'm the first speaker, so let me just give a quick background into, you know, um, FTM and um, or what I talk about, the other topic. So basically, FGM is female genital mutilation. We all know that. And uh, it's a direct, um, deliberate harm, deliberate damage to healthy female genital tissue. It is not right. It is not acceptable. No form of FGM is acceptable. So that being said, medicalization is, um, WHO defines it as a situation where a medical worker or any kid at, at all practice MGM caught a girl. Either the procedure was performed in a health clinic or at home, 
a private health clinic, government health clinic, or even if it's performed in the bush. As far as it is done by um, a health worker of any kid, be it nurse, be it doctor, um, community health extension workers, um, what, what other kid that we have in the health system? So I think those are the basic kid that we also have with mental health and assistance. So either it's performed by any of these, whether in government hospital, private hospital, at home, yes, I've been told that some people go home, so at home, or anywhere in the village, in the bush, in the community, it is medicalization. Okay, so however, the term has also been used very broadly to say that if the medical equipment or supplies like anesthesia, anesthesia, um, um, as I mean, supplied by an health worker to another quarter, it, is, it can also be referred to as um, medicalization. So, healthcare medicalization is, is wrong. Um, FGM being done by an health worker doesn't make it right. It is against the medical ethics. It is um, against the oath that medical professions so, so It is um, against human rights. FGM is against human rights. And it doesn't reduce the effects of FGM. It doesn't limit the effects of FGM. And then why do people go and, um, and okay, let me just quickly say that this medicalization of FGM is actually very dangerous to work with people as activists, as grassroots activists working to end it. It presents a very dangerous dimension to me. And I must say that medicalization is what we are beginning to see. Those are the new trends that we are beginning to see in, even in communities. And people now say that, oh, limit risk of FGM. They want to take their daughters to the hospital to limit some very risk, some of the risks we talk to, to we talk about to um, encourage parents to advocate for behavioral change in FGM, um, some of the risks we talk about. So people are now beginning to say that to limit this risk, they want to take um, their daughters to the hospital, they want to take their daughters to the health center um, to perform FGM. One of the risks that we talk about when we go for advocacy as grassroots advocates are that we all know is pain. So they, they believe that when um, a girl is being caught by an health worker or is being done in an hospital, the girl may have access to an anesthesia to relieve pain. Another thing is that they also talk about um, you know, unnecessary restrictions. We talk about um, when girls are, when, during the procedure, during FGM procedure, um, usually older adults you know, help restrict um, a girl to be mutilated, the survivor, older adults come and they restrict. And during the process of restriction, a lot of things can happen. Um, you know, being that the power, the power holding the young girl is superior, and then they have more strength. There can be bone fracture, there can be tissue damage, there can be bruises, and all sorts of um, Complications can arise with restriction alone. So to limit the um, risk of restriction, people now say that they want to go to the hospital, that once the patient is um, being anesthetized, maybe the patient does not know, um, I mean, the girl to the court doesn't know what is happening. At least nobody, she won't even feel the pain and then nobody will have to come and restrict that and they can perform FGM. And so this is also one of the reasons why people go to the hospital to, or to the health to health clinics or walk up to health workers to help um, mutilate their daughters. Okay, so another reason is what um, Raymond gave the other time that people are not beginning to move from rural communities to the city. And then in the city, what you really have is there are less quarters, what you have is um, you know, health clinic, health outlet, health center, health workers. So you, you people, parents now walk up to them to say that they, they want to. Um, cut uh, their daughters. Another reason why people go again is uh, to limit complications, genital damage complications. They believe that also can understand the anatomy of genital structures. So they, they, when when they take them to when they take their daughters to health workers, they are able to cut with minimal damage to all that tissue. So they believe that okay, they are able to focus only on the part that is to be cut, which is also very wrong. Um, Okay, so one other reason is the psychological um, concept or psychology to provide like a psychology relief 
This is what we found in my home center where I did my house job. So a parent actually came and said that she wants to call her daughter. And, um, you know, one of the nurses that attended to her actually said that she was going to help her. But when we had nurse and told that she said, oh, that she, she told her not to tell anybody that she said it because she actually just wants to provide the psychology that she's just going to pinch off something off and she's not really going to court. And we have to, hospital authority had to take it up and we made her understand, advocate, doctors, nurses in the facility had to make her understand that no, you are not even supposed to encourage, you are supposed to stand outrightly against that right from um, that and we had to take the person through FGM and the medical profession. So uh, to provide psychology relief is also part of why um, you know um, some health workers perform um, F, um, FGM in the clinic setting. So that being said, I just want to quickly say that for all of these reasons, to relieve pain, anesthesia, reduce complication, it does not limit, does not restrict, um, it does not limit um, FGM complication. FGM complication is the same. Because the thing about FGM is that this tissue, this genital tissue is very healthy. There is nothing wrong with it. It's already created completely by God. You don't have to recreate it. You don't have to touch it. It's perfect. Unlike the male, unlike male um, circumcision, that what is being cut off in the hospital is the first skin. And we all know the complications that can come, that can follow, that can um, arise if the sports skin is left intact. So what is being removed for male is just the false skin, and that has to be removed. But for female, the genital you don't have to remove any false skin. You don't have to remove the prophecies. You don't have to remove the clitoris. You don't have to remove anything. It's already complete and is well knitted together by the creator, <laughs> let me say that. So you don't have to do anything. So whether the, whether the procedure is performed in um, a government facilities, performed at home, is performed anywhere, it does not reduce the complication. As far as you damage, as far as you touch and tamper with that, you've already disrupted the function. And every part of the gen female genital organ, every part of female genital organ has specific issues a specific um, function, I mean, that those um, organs perform. So there's no need, there's no need to touch it. So, and that is why FGM is wrong. Medicalization of FGM is absolutely wrong. So people should get this and get this in. So this is what we tell community members when we go to communities where they have questions about, oh, what if they go to the hospital? Yes, they don't have to battle with complication. So we let them understand that as grassroots advocate, this is what you should tell them that the female genital organs, they are completely made. They don't have to, you don't have to touch them. Any attempt to disrupt anything is a direct damage to the function and you are really inhibiting the function. So um, that being said, um, what, what does the medical profession itself, what does it say about MTV? Um, it's one of the quotes we usually um, take when we get inducted into the profession is to say that you will do, firstly, do no harm, very, very important. And what I said earlier is that once you make any attempts to disrupt anything around the female genitals, you direct damage to healthy tissue. So that means you're doing harm in the process. Do not kill, it's also part of what we um, the holds we, we 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 take when we get inducted. So it's you going performing FGM by an health worker. An health worker performing FGM is directly working against the medical ethics and directly working against the holds um, and the laws binding the medical profession, binding and um, behaviors and practices in the medical profession. And I must say that this attracts a. a, a, a Great um, sanctions for us um, as doctors. Right from medical school, we are being taught, we are being lectured, we are being tutored by other professionals that FGM is really wrong. So they've already incorporated um, FGM. FGM is already been incorporated into our curriculum, and uh, right from medical school, they, are, they they make it very known and very clear to medical students that you are not supposed to. So when these guys, their practice, 
when they start practicing. And it's not, it's not only for doctors, it's like that for nurses, it's like that for midwives, it's like that for other cases of, of workers, um, even paramedicals, the way they mention it during their community medicine to, to, to say that um, the FDM is a major topic that usually reoccur, I mean, during all the lectures. So everybody knows that FGM is wrong. It's just that at times our, our belief system, our belief that the tradition fights against what we know that is right. So any medical um, professional performing MGM cannot claim ignorance of the fact that MGM is wrong. We were told, we were taught, we've all been told and we've all been taught. So if you perform it, if you are caught that sanctions, pure sanction um, against them, um, um, that will be um, leveled against that person. One of those sanctions is that the medical license can be seized if the person is already practicing and such cases is being reported, license can be seized in Nigeria. We heard about the doctor that was, uh, um, that was reported in the United Kingdom and what happened to um, the doctor, the license was seized, the doctor was killed. So the medical um, license can be seized. Um, also, another thing is that if a person has not been practicing before, if the person is just about to um, get the um, practicing license, if they are practicing license, the person could be denied. Um, yes, the person could also be tried according to Nigeria law. Nigeria law firms violate against person's prohibition has clearly states that medicalization of MTM is not acceptable, it's wrong, and then there's a um, the, 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 the sanction for medical professionals, for medical healthcare workers caught them in the heart. Also, there are a lot of states now have um, anti-FGM prohibition law. I'm not sure about the exact number, but I know that more than 20 states already have um, anti-FGM prohibition um, law we have in the state I work in Ocean State, and it's also clearly written in the state that medicalization of FGM is no, is not acceptable. And any health worker caught in the act or reported is going to be tried. And there's one thing we tell health workers when we go to train them: we really tell them that you no, know, you don't want people to know you for something very bad. You want people to know you for maybe a breakthrough in practice, a breakthrough in uh, discoveries, in research, and all of that. You don't want to be that very bad fit against any profession. So they think too high, and then um, most times um, people look into this. And I want to say that in Nigeria, the case is very peculiar. Unlike Egypt, where most or uh, most of the um, most of the medicalization case cases um, performed by um, doctors, I say in Nigeria, it's the, um, according to the National Demographic Health Survey, we we saw and we know that um, most of the cases in Nigeria they are performed by either community health extension workers and um, at times midwives, aside nurses, and then doctors also perform. This act. So I, I think about 7% um, is performed by midwives, 7 to 8% um, nurses, and all of that. So I must just say that um, yes, medicalization is really one of the new trends that we are seeing in communities. Health workers are performing this. Data also shows that Nigeria is one of the 10 countries um, with um, medicalization of um, FGM. And then those countries, they also say that one in 10 girls were actually caught, was caught by an health worker. So it's really Nigeria is one of the new trends. Health worker must know that um, it's wrong. It's against the medical profession. It's against, it's against medical ethics. It doesn't reduce the complication. The complication is the same. Whether it's being done at home, anywhere in the hospital, the complication of FGM is the same and it's not acceptable. And anybody caught in such has will not only be dismissed, will be tried by the law, the certificate, maybe the license might be seized. Yeah, if the person doesn't have a license at all before, the person might not eventually get that license. Um, it's not even might. Um, there's a medical and dental council, so there's a regulatory body for um, doctors, there's a regulatory body for nurses, for midwives. We all have a regulatory body. And these bodies frown very well, closely at um, FTM. And I must say that a lot of um, work because of this new trend, a lot of work and um, 
effort is being directed or channeled towards ensuring that all work as oh so if you if you want to claim ignorance of it okay so we now want to train you want to train your regulatory body on um how you can uh, on on the effect of fdm and um, the the sanctions that associated with so a lot of effort is being directed towards training health workers to ensure that um, non would come up and claim ignorance of this fact. Um, UNFP is doing a lot of work around this, training a lot of health workers and uh, medical um, bodies, are, medical um, personnel are gradually coming up um, every time to say that they're joining um, you know, forces against FTM and all of that. So yes, the, 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 the work is going on um, and we just hope that things will get better that very soon all health workers would um, be aware of this and none would, everybody would uh, pledge their allegiance to ensure that they um, join hands together to end um, female genital mutilation in Nigeria, yes, and do valid. So um, thank you very much once again for having me. Uh, I, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Dr. Kosley, for such brilliant um, presentation. Thank you. Keywords wrong, you know. Um, the medical profession has taken um, has made an allegiance to ensure that all they do is to save lives and not to damage lives. Thanks for re-emphasizing that and then also making us understand the laws within the profession, stating clearly that female genital mutilation. Uh, medicalization of FGM is actually not right. And then also the fact that um, medicalization does not um, um, make FGM better. You know, it doesn't, um, people should stop living in denial that if it's carried out in the hospital, maybe the consequences are not there. So thanks for restating that fact. Thank you very much. I'm sure a lot of people have actually learned from that. So um, thank you. So participants, kindly send in your questions in the question and answer session. Make sure you drop your questions. It is very important because the idea or the beauty of this webinar is for us to learn is beyond talking, talking, talking. It's for us to crusade and create positive behavioral change. That is the essence of um, coming up with this. And that's why GMC is focused on ending female genital mutilation by empowering activists, you know, to be on the front line of this campaign. So please do well to send in your questions. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kersley. And um, we also said a whole lot of things about training of health um, practitioners and how they should be remembered for positive impacts and not for negative impacts. And um, I know that you have worked so well with UNFPA and other organizations, but I'm very happy and glad that um, Dr. Zubeida from UNFPA is here and should be able to give us first-hand information of um, the efforts of UNFPA in ending medicalization in Nigeria. UNFPA has supported GMC a whole lot and um, other organizations in ensuring that FGM um, comes to an end. So I count it a very um, a, a privilege to have Dr. Zubeda here representing UNFPA Nigeria to give us um, adequate information on the state of medicalization in Nigeria. Good afternoon, Dr. Zubeda. Good afternoon, Ayo. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to GMC for inviting UNFPA to be part of this. Um, and um, well, I'm going to share my screen and show my presentation. Costly has made my work very easy because she's gone through all the overview. So um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, great. So um, I'll skip through a lot of the parts that she's done. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about some of the issues she has and then really go down to um, what UNFPA is doing in Nigeria, as you mentioned. Um, just a quick overview, she mentioned it. But just to let us know that FGM is not a Nigeria problem, it's a global problem with over 200 million women and girls affected and about 3 million new cases uh, every year. And it's all over Sub-Saharan Africa, in Europe and things like that. And most of it is between um, zero to 14 years that girls get mutilated. We try not to use cut because cut is too narrow. It's what is happening is mutilation. Um, so in Nigeria, we know that Nigeria is the seventh most populated country in the world. So whereas our um, FGM rate has decreased from the 2013 to the 2018 NDHS, 
um, by about five percentage points. 20% um, of Nigerian girls being mutilated comes to a huge number when you think about our population. Um, and it has a higher prevalence in the South um, than in the North. And then specifically when we look at uh, medicalization, Nigeria actually has a 12% medicalization rate. So while that does not sound very high, um, again, when you look at the population of Nigeria, 12% of 200 million comes to a lot of, lot of um, cases. So it is a huge amount. So why do we still see FGM persisting? Um, it's a matter of gender inequality. It's a matter of um, the girl, child, the woman being seen as an object that needs to be prepared or for marriage and things like that. It's also because our law enforcement is weak, unfortunately. Um, Costly mentioned all the VAT laws that we have. We have over 24 states in Nigeria that have domesticated um, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law Act into law, but enforcement is where we're really um, lacking, where we're very weak. So we do have the laws, but they're not enforced. And of course, you also touched about the cultural beliefs and practices. Um, it seems as if even us as medicals, sometimes our culture overrides our, our teachings in professional schools. And that's why this issue of medicalization, FGM, um, which is defined as to, um, any FGM practiced by any category of healthcare provider, wherever it is, whether it's in a private or public clinic at home or elsewhere. Uh, and that is why, because the culture is really, really persistent. So it doesn't seem to um, be separated from your professional life. And that's why we get this medicalization, go ahead. Um, Costly has already discussed this. It's whether we assist, whether we do it, whether we provide um, anesthesia or pain relief, um, whether it's um, we do it in the hospital, or we do it abroad, or whether, you know, any, any aiding that any medical professional does is considered medicalization of FGM. So um, if you give cotton wool because you think the traditional cutter is doing it unsafely and you provide them clean gloves and things, you're actually aiding um, FGM. So it's still not acceptable. And this is just a map showing where medicalization occurs in Nigeria. You can see um, most of us are blue, uh, the dark blue. Um, but you can see we have one state there, which is red, which is Ekiti. And Ekiti has the highest rate of medicalization of FGM among um, girls in Nigeria. So this is nice for us to be able to track where a lot of our efforts need to go. Um, it's, it's a trend, as you said, it's an emerging trend, which is getting worse all over the country. But there are a few hotspots. So you can see Ekiti, Ondo, Edu, Imu, and Abia are some of the hotspots that we have for medicalization in Nigeria. Um, but what, who is doing medicalization? So Mohasan Bellud in 2020 published a paper. And unlike the traditional FGM that we see where it's the um, least wealthy, it's the least educated that are doing, um, performing FGM on their children. When it comes to medicalization, it's actually the other way around. So as you can see, the ranking is increasing from 29 to 75% from the middle to the richest ranking in Nigeria. Um, also, the more educated a woman is, the more likely that she, uh, her child will be mutilated um, through medicalization. Um, so it seems, yes, the awareness is getting to them that it's unsafe to do it in the rural communities. And so the more educated and the richer we are to have the funds to do this, uh, we're going to health professionals to do that. And again, another thing which we find is that it's the, um, the rural community have higher chances of reporting medicalization, which is a kudos because it means we've created a lot of awareness of the harm um, that FGM does in the community. But we haven't said, we haven't emphasized enough that no matter who or where it's done, it's actually a gross human rights violation and it's just not acceptable at all. So medicalization is a form of child abuse. It's a medical malpractice as um, Costly rightly mentioned. Um, there's no consent, so it's again a violation of that person's right, and it's a threat to the health and well-being of women and girls. So medicalization makes it safer, but it doesn't remove the fact that you're violating a human being, and it still has the long-term consequences like the psychological, the social, the sexual consequences, which um, girls and women continue to suffer for the rest of their lives. So globally, um, UNFPA, we do have a strategy against the medicalization of FGM, which we developed with partners, um, and it has four prongs. Creating a supportive legal infrastructure, strengthening the health system's capacity, 
uh, mobilizing political will and financial resources, and then really strengthening the data component, the monitoring and evaluation um, component of it. So what have we been doing in Nigeria? Um, for instance, I would, you know, UNFPA through the joint program, which is UNFPA UNICEF joint program for the elimination of FGM. Uh, we've recently supported the Federal Ministry of Health to develop the national policy and plan of action for the elimination of Nigeria. Rather, I should say review because we did have one before, but with COVID, with medicalization, we needed to review that to include this emerging issues. So this new policy does clearly um, articulate the plan of action that we need to do to address medicalization of Nigeria. And again, we've been supporting the advocacy and domestication passage and application because that's more important. It's not just good enough to pass the law, but we need to operationalize and apply the law, um, especially the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law. And then we've been working very closely with the National Human Rights Commission to create awareness and to really champion the elimination um, through a human rights angle as well. So, so far, at least we have three of the states which have fully sensitized and we're looking forward to doing more work this year and next with the National Human Rights Commission. So in terms of strengthening the health systems capacity, um, we've been championing curriculum review with uh, support of UNFPA. Um, that's been done with the Federal Ministry of Health. Um, but we've also developed a national protocol on the management of the complications from FGM in Nigeria. And this covers the long-term, the immediate and the long-term consequences of FGM. So the clinical, the psychological, and the sexual complications that come from the procedure. Um, and as Cosley had mentioned, we've been using this and to build capacity across the states um, for, for our healthcare workers to not only be able to manage the complications, but we're using that as an opportunity to really create awareness amongst them and to make them champions and advocates to actually stop medicalization of FGM. So as they're getting the capacity to manage cases, um, they're also recognizing the harm that is being done. Um, and hopefully they will um, help with the awareness creation in the communities, because especially, for example, the lower CADA, um, JCHUs, they are supposed to spend most of their time in the community and they do go out there to create the sensitization and the awareness in the communities as well. So in terms of mobilizing political will, um, we have been working with uh, um, the Federal Ministry of Health and with one of our partners, the Center for Population Reproductive Health, to really engage the medical regulatory bodies um, to pass laws that will penalize healthcare workers of all cadres that engage in the practice. And then we've also been working with them to include the pre prevention of FGM, the curriculum of healthcare workers. Costly mentioned that this is already in the medical curriculum and it's mentioned several times by lecturers, but the other health uh, medical professions also need to be aware that this FGM is, um, is, a, is a do harm um, procedure, which is against all our teaching. Um, and as we've mentioned, we've been training the healthcare workers and then we've been assisting the state ministries of health to really establish anti-FGM prevention programs in their communities as well. And as I mentioned, um, we've been working with the healthcare professionals to become agents of change among their different um, schools. So working with the doctors, working with the pediatricians, working with the gynecologists, uh, working with the community healthcare workers. And just that we have a poster where actually we had 13 regulatory bodies and associations sign a declaration to actually um, punish uh, any of the professionals that come from their associations that actually practice FGM. So this was in 2018. And since then we've worked in the states to engage state chapters to get similar signatures and um, written declarations of um, abandoning FGMs all towards ed, um, eliminating medicalization of FGM. So um, in terms of strengthening the monitoring, evaluation, and accountability, uh, we've, as we mentioned, we've been using healthcare workers as surveillance champions in the community, and they have data collecting tools at the health facility. So this data will allow us to capture women and girls, babies, and especially that are coming in with complications of FGM or who have had FGM. It will help us to identify which local governments they're coming from in that state so that we can actually intensify our efforts. And it also tells us who does it. So we need to know, you know, is, is it, for example, the medical professionals that are doing it more in this local government or, or is it the traditional cutter so that we intensify and really target our prevention efforts. Um, and that's just a picture of some of the healthcare workers in a review meeting where we look at the data and then um, program around the data that we pick up from the states. So what have we learned? 
Um, we've learned that FGM is a public health challenge. Um, it's not just in Nigeria, it's in low and middle income countries everywhere. Medicalization is a recognized catalyst because we're thinking that, okay, we're making a lot of efforts in the communities, creating the awareness, and then now our health professionals are doing that. And we know that we really need to go back to the roots and find out what it is, you know, just shows that we really need to work more in terms of identifying those social norms that drive even the professionals that know better and who have signed oaths of doing no harm to actually do that. Um, awareness creation, we've done that a lot, especially around um, the legislation. Um, and then we really need to work with people like the GMC to really create this high level media coverage. And we need the media support for ensuring that when cases are heard, they're actually followed up to a logical conclusion because we hear of cases of FGM being reported and then um, maybe it's reported to the police, then what? We really need that pressure from media to make sure that the cases are prosecuted. Because if we don't show that high level um, awareness that it is really against the law, then people will continue to go unpunished. Um, so that's some of the things that we're doing as well. And we're just, as we said, you know, really interacting with the communities, with healthcare workers to really change their social norms and their perceptions of what is right and what is not right. And then really we want girls and women to be champions for this. And this is something that um, like Cosby's NGO, VFN have been doing, really building the assets of young girls to become champions and advocates for uh, eliminating FGM. And we really congratulate um, all the you know, speakers here as well, because they've been doing a lot of things for, against really making women um, champion this. So finally, a strong committed coalition is needed in order for us to achieve elimination of medicalization in Nigeria. So all hands on deck, we need the you know, we need the politicians, we need the men and boys, we need the young people, we need the traditional religious leaders, we need all of you. Um, I don't have a picture of media there, but so I should have, you know, we really need the media as well. So thank you very much for listening. Over. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for your little um, and colorful presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, obviously, UNFP has been doing a lot. And um, like you said, we need to actually trace this to the roots. And that, that actually um, introduces our next speaker because she's been working at the grassroots. So thank you very much, Dr. Um, Zubeida. We already have some questions for you. So um, we'd be happy to have you hang on to um, the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. So I'm um, talking about going to um, engaging grassroots activists. Um, our next speaker is a grassroots ad activist that also doubles as a midwife. Remember, Dr. Zubeda mentioned that um, medicalization doesn't have to be you perpetrating it yourself. Any form of giving it, any form of assistance, you know, just enabling the practice, you know, so you don't you don't have to be. Um, a professional medical, you could, you could be paramedic, you understand, whatever relationship you have with the medical profession, in whatever way you assist or enable or encourage, you know, people to perpetrate female genital mutilation and medically, then you're also a culprit. So um, I would be welcoming Gift. Hi, Gift. Are you there? Gift. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Yes, I am. But Gift is not a doctor anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Gift. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Thank you, Ayo. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, Over to you. Kindly introduce yourself for as many people that have not seen you or heard of you before. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, so kindly introduce yourself to yeah, you as many new faces here. Okay. Uh, my name is Gift Abu. I am an activist and also a medical person. Are you okay? Yes, thank you. So go Let's ahead. Go ahead we can hear you. Okay. Um, yes. Um, I think the two speakers have done well. And uh, I'll be talking about Oh, I think it's breaking. Hello. I think her line is breaking a bit. Um so yes, why we are waiting. Yeah, why yeah. we are waiting for um 
for gift Abu to join us. Uh, please, if you have any question from the presentation from uh, Dr. Cosley and the, the, the beautiful presentation from uh, Dr. Zubaida also, please uh, do it. Um, you can drop it on the chat box uh, so that we can also amplify it and get everything answered at the same time. Hello, Mom Gift. Are you there? Oh, I think she stepped out a bit now. Okay, you so know what, um, Raymond? Maybe we should take yeah. some questions from you then. Okay, so I, I wanted to throw a question, and uh, I actually want to throw that question to uh, Dr. Costley because um, there has been series of arguments, right, at this point about, you know, FGM is also something that is embedded on people's culture and. Um, even the elites, the doctors, and all those people are all coming from somewhere. They all have some form of belief system. And so you have a situation where someone who, who's, uh, who is a very strong believer of the practice is, has also gone to school to become a doctor, become a, a healthcare worker, and has all the resources to back up whatever thing that they want to perpetrate. So the question is, um, are there mechanisms that are in place in the hospitals uh, to ensure that people that are still perpetrating this act are being uh, tracked? Because, you know, we had a community engagement in a particular uh, community and then um, while we were talking to the traditional ruler, while the man was in fact telling us that this thing is no longer in this community, we have long stopped it and all that. And one of the women who was sitting down there with her baby had to raise her hand to say that she begged to differ. You know that she cannot come alive, you know, because it is here that the thing is still being done there. And so the question now becomes for perhaps some doctors who are still doing this, are there mechanisms? Yes, you talked about the VAP law and all those stuff that have been instituted in over 20 states. Are there system inside hospital, inside the health facilities to ensure that people don't do this thing or people who do this thing are also brought to book, just like the person in, in, from UK? Okay, thank you very much, Raymond. Oh, well, that question is actually a very good question because Nigeria is very weak. <laughs> and um, I think even in Ocean State, even the last I heard, we had about 330 primary health care facilities in Ocean State, just Ocean State, not to talk of the whole of Nigeria. So I must say that, um, well, um, like Dr. Zereda rightly said, the UNFP is working with a lot of regulatory bodies, both uh, the nurses, midwives, doctors to um, you know, train them on FGM and then also to help them strengthen the system of uh, tracking and um, sanctioning health workers that go against the um, oath. Of course, that is a very good one. Um, but when you come to the hospital level, each um, cadre of health care facilities differs. So I want to say this, because I'm doing very fast. I, I work at the grassroots level and I know what it is like. You know, there are some communities that even the healthcare centers, when you get there, before you can even get there, you know, you it will take a very long. Uh, are, okay, let me just say, hard to reach communities, very very hard to reach communities. Less supervision from anybody. Community health extension workers are the ones majorly people working up to every day. You know, nurses are come occasionally they come, and doctors oh maybe once in a week and all of that. So um, I think healthcare. Um, Healthcare can health, health, health clean health facilities can that different. So for those for primary health care facilities, there's a general uh, concession and there's a general rule and there's a general training and teaching to say that for um, medical health workers are not expected to practice FGK. But within the facility, I cannot categorically say that at the primary health care level we have that um, very functioning system. But I'm aware that there's FGM, um, um, there's now FGM protocol case management, FGM um, pro, um, pro case protocol management, and FGM referral um, training that is being done for health workers. And when they train these health workers, when, they, um, when the Ministry of Health introduced this um, into the primary health care system, part of what they do, is to ensure that health workers are properly trained on what FGM is and how to provide service, FGM services to survivors of FGM. And this is basically implemented mainly at the primary health care level. So even though there may not be specific uh, um, 
and quotes specific sanctioning our healthcare system. But there's a general consensus that trickled down from the Federal Ministry of Health to the State Ministry of Health and then down to the primary health care level because um, you cannot provide service for a survival of FGM, and part of the services you provide is counseling. You can't counsel the survival and then go ahead in that state facility to say you want to perform FGM. I've been to like two or three healthcare facilities personally find out, I mean, in hard to reach area. And then once they just see that you're a stranger, aside from the fact that they are very strict about MTM, they also even try to lecture you about the effect of MTM. So um, in as much as I cannot um, answer your question in full, but then I'm aware that um, there's even um, reporting to, to report um, to report cases, to report survivors of FGM that have been attended, attended to, and then all of these data go directly to the donors, partners, and then eventually gets to the Federal Ministry of Health as well. So um, at the uh, grassroots level, at the primary health care level. And it's the same for teaching hospitals. I'm aware that it, um, there's, okay, so for the facility where I worked, I worked there for like, I think, a year and a half, and it's a teaching hospital. There's the standard um, protocol against FGM in that facility. And then it's personal to the facility because uh, it's not a public statement, it's not a public policy or pasted by the Federal Ministry of Health. But then, I mean, everybody is also aware that FGM is wrong. We do a lot of, even during antenatal classes, FGM is now one of the major things that is being talked about during um, antenatal classes that women, um, girls are not to be caught, girls are to be left home. The analysis um, facilitates um, some of these classes. So, and it's like that too for um, general hospitals. And it's like that too at the health center, at primary, at the grassroots level. So what I'm trying to say is that there is no way an health worker is, part of the task of an health worker is to train and counsel and, you know, teach the effects of MGM and provide services. And then you go ahead and that's the first to do it. If you do it, that's very private. And if you have caught you will be sanctioned. So, Yes, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but I, don't, no, I, don't I, I think I perfectly understand um, because uh, I perfectly understand because of the system that we have here in Nigeria, where most cases, one of the greatest challenge we have is data also. Like we don't have, you know, those data at different levels. But again, let me quickly point out what um, uh, Miss Margaret just pointed out something. She said until, you know, she said until What's that again? She said until local laws uh, is enacted by traditional leaders for communities, it will be difficult for FGM to be completely eradicated. I, I really think that GMC and UNFP have been doing very fantastic work in engaging all the you know necessary stakeholders, not just uh, traditional rulers, but also religious leaders also engaging all the all the who is who, training media media practitioners, whoever has the capacity to, uh, whose voice can actually help in the campaign. I think they are doing great work, even both in this uh, project and other projects that I also know about, they are really doing a lot. But I think it's important for us to also really look at what are the things that uh, we can actually do with the resources that are available to us. And that is why I think that this, um, this, um, this webinar is very important, talking about medicalization, because it's like when you are chasing something out of a particular environment, and it is trying to run away from you only to run into the hand of another thing that is also going to amplify what you are trying to fight against. Because no matter how you chase somebody from the community, there will always be health issues and they are going to run into the hands of medical professionals, health workers, who if for any reason they are the ones also championing the FGM, every effort from the beginning would have been a waste because they get to listen to them, they get to hear from them. Thank, Thank you, you so much for really pointing that out. Yeah, thanks also for laying emphasis on that. Um, so um, before we get um, gifts to join in, I think we have some other questions and I'll be directing this to Dr. Zubeida. Though we have more of um, compliments, brilliant, um, brilliant presentation, very informative um, presentation. Thank you for this. Um, nice presentation, um, excellent presentation. Wow, it's been more of compliments, but um, there are a couple of questions. So let's start with another one from Margaret Honor. And it says, have you heard of Clitorid, an organization that performs clitoral 
clitoral correction. How positive is this? Can women really use an artificial clitoris? I mean, I've heard of um, support system for um, survivors of FGM. I, I've heard of them, particularly those who have gone through infibulation. I've learned of um, some sort of medical correction, but artificial clitoris, I think that's the first time I'm hearing that. How does it look? How will it feel? I mean, I'm a survivor of FGM, so talking about artificial clitoris, I'm curious. <laughs> so Dr. Zubeda, what do you think about that? Will that work? Um, that's a very interesting question because we need to separate um, female genital mutilation and the consequences of female genital mutilation from cosmetic um, mm. reconstruction. Mm. And um, mm. we know that it's becoming more and more popular for women and girls and men to also to engage in um, reproductive organ reconstruction um, for cosmetic reasons. Um, so clitoride may be good, but will it address the mutilation? How many of them can afford it? Um, and is it widely available? So while it may be good for those elitists that can afford um, cosmetic interventions, uh, we really need to continue to work in terms of preventing FGM from happening in the first place. And if I had money to put, mm. I would continue with my grassroots efforts and managing complications that help us safety level rather than going for the reconstruction. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but you know, money is finite and you have to decide where to put it. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much, Dr. Zubeda. Yeah, money is finite. And um, as much as um, we're trying hard to correct these things, I think we need to focus and remain consistent with tackling it from the roots, from the foundation, you know, which is stopping the practice or weakening the practice to say, and there's a global target to end FGM by 2030. I, I, I don't know how realistic that is. <laughs> this is 2021. And um, from my experiences at the grassroots, we've done so much, but at the same time, we have so much to do we because um, exactly. um, as much as some, um, some communities are at the awareness creation level, some are even living in denial. So um, yeah. the, the, the progress report of different communities vary. So I don't know how all these communities would come together to have a zero free, you know, um, attitude or experience by 2030. I'm not sure. Um, it's not been mean being negative, but um, I'm not sure. Uh, let's check if Gift is back. Hi, Gift, are you there? Yes, sorry, dear. Networking issue, but I'm back. Fine. Good to have you back. Over to you. Sorry, dear. Yeah. So um, I was speaking on the factors that has resisted the total abandonment of uh, medicalization by, you know, by, of FGM. I was speaking not just as a medical person, but also as an activist, because this falls down to the communities where we work and we see things every day. And one of the factors is the medical persons, mostly in the community, seeing cutting as a FGMC as a means of livelihood. Um, it's to shock you to, to be here that a medical person actually takes you to where she does the cutting, you understand? So you, you get to get money from every woman that comes in every day, 1,000, 2,000 from them, just to carry out the cutting. And for me, I think as a medical person, just like Dr. So also said, as a medical person, you are meant to save life. Even if an organ is dying, as a medical person, you're supposed to like help it to be in shape and not to totally eradicate, to like, you know, you know destroy that particular organ. So they do this, as a means of livelihood. So stopping it, it's not because they don't, they don't want to stop it, but stopping it for them is like, if you stop it now, how would they feel? Outside what they get paid as a normal salary. That's one basic factor from my experience and my interaction in the communities. Um, another factor has to do with the medical persons in the communities again, seeing um, the leaders as in all, they respect the willpower of the community leaders. They tend to respect the culture of that particular community and to also protect themselves against any harm that might come. But I see that as not being an excuse as a medical person to carry out FGM in any way you find yourself. 
Community leaders are not monsters. Yes, FGM is an issue that every community respects and carry on right from inception. But I think the people in the community respect more of the medical person than any other person in the community. So I feel that as a medical person in that place, you know very well that FGM is a harmful practice. You know the harmful effects that follows when the girl is being mutilated. What I think you should do is organize maybe with your colleagues. If you can't go alone, most times you're scared to go alone. See how you can meet up with these chiefs. You know, they have told them the implications that follows after a girl is being mutilated. Because most of them don't know that there's health implications that follows. They only see it as a cultural thing that they need to follow. But if you, as a medical person, meet with them one on one, sit them down politely and not be insulted. Oh, did we lose gift again? Is she there? And not being rude. You okay. tell her, okay, this is how it is. It is no longer acceptable. This is what the guest stands to face in future. Make them understand. And I think they are no monsters. You give them, yes, most times you give them is abandoned FGM based on has to do with the complication that follows. Mm -hmm. They will listen. Sometimes when you're talking to them, they will act as if they are not listening to you. You understand? But they are listening. They are listening to you. When once you're done, they want to make one or two inquiries from their colleagues. And they will hear them say, okay, yes, it is true. This is it. This is it. Before you know, they will start, you know, embracing your talk, embracing what you stand to like educate them. They will abandon FGM. But if you keep on, you know, you're scared and you keep on practicing it as a medical person, they will like that. If you as a medical person are telling us that there's no harm in kind of FGM, then you make the work for activists to be very, very tedious. Because when, as an activist, I go to the community and saying there's health implication that follows FGM, and they're telling you, okay, how come you, as an activist, you are saying? To make the community leaders understand the implications that follows. Change is not a dead thing. You continue talking. You continue letting them know the implications. With time, they will, they will understand. With time, they will embrace your idea and tend to NMGM. That is another thing. Um, another factor is the lack of research by medical persons, mostly in the communities. When you say you're a medical person, most times, some of us, school pass through us. We are not the one that pass through school. You just go through medical school and you're out. You don't really know what and what, as in the real thing that are inside. Because sometimes you're talking about the complications of medical mutilation to a health worker. She's telling you that there's no health implications so long as it is done medically. I've heard that several times for a lot, from a lot of medical persons. And I'm like, it's like you don't even know what you're doing. You don't know your job. You don't know what you're supposed to do as a medical person. So I think there's a lot of lack of research when it comes to complications that has to do with FGM by a lot of healthcare persons. You yeah. must understand the implications, but not everybody. So I think there should be research upon research that has to, uh, that has to do with medical um, complications of FGM by medical persons too, either in the community or in the bar. I'm using the community because most of this stuff happens mostly in the community from the healthcare person. You find them few in the urban, but mostly in the rural areas. So I think the research should be done regularly by them to help them a lot to learn. And another factor over them all is lack of control, checks, and discipline by the healthcare bodies. If you send the healthcare person in the community to do, to carry out a and everybody's talking about ending up the um, medical person being involved in carrying on the um, medical mutilation. This should sound like, um, should I say like a bell, you know, to the, the bodies of the medical persons. So if they can even set up teams to go to this community once in a while to make findings, to follow up, to see if actually these health persons actually doing FGM. But when you hear that medical person are carrying on from the communities, you don't do anything, you don't go to find out. Even if maybe you find out that, yes, somebody in the medical field is actually involved, 
in kind of meditation, meditation, you tend to hide the person. But once you keep on doing that, they will say, okay, fine. If our bodies are hiding us from doing this, we'll keep on doing it. So there should be this control, there should be this checks, regular checks among the healthcare person in the communities to make sure that they don't carry FGM. And if they are carrying anybody that is caught carrying out major motivation, should be made to pay. Should be made to pay and they're going for it. Because once one person is taking as in like caught and taking, for example, for and like it's being punished, either go to jail or whatever it is. I think others will learn. But so long as there is no checks, there is no concern. Nobody is being, you know, um, punished for carrying out FGM as a medical person. The practice will continue going on. And you see that we as activists talking about ending FGM or uh, medication of FGM is really up in the communities would be like a problem for, for us because they are not supporting us and we are struggling to see that they accept the fact that it's happening and also help we as an activist to end FGM. So I think these are the major factors I have Thing and I think really will help in the uh, abandoning of gym as a medical person. Thank you so much, Ayo. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think Ayo is somewhere. Um, okay. Thank you so much for that brilliant presentation, uh, Madam yeah. Gift. Yeah. Uh, but again, I would like just like to. I like to I like to ask a question and just throw something at you. So okay. somebody said something from the and I deducted it from from the group chat where somebody was talking about you know retired health workers you know who after all their work in the cities and all that okay. they retired back home and they are still practicing it. And now as a grassroots campaigner, what are your efforts to identify people who have already you know been in the field for a very long time? Who have been doing this and now they are now right in the community where demand is actually high for them, you know, and then they are still practicing this. What are the ways that you've been using to engage with these people, knowing that to be difficult to change their belief? Yeah, I think um, that's a good question, Raymond. I've come across a lot of them like that. Um, to them, there's nothing wrong with it. Is their thing and they're from the community. I, I what we've been doing is engaging them in other things they can do. If you are a retired person, of course you're collecting your pension. You can look for other things, other businesses to do. Like I said, they are not doing this for free. They get paid for every guy they caught. They get paid for every woman they caught. So what we, what we tend to tell, every, every time we meet with them is look for another job and do, look for another thing and do, look for a business and establish. It's difficult though, among, 10 or 20 that will come across, say about five or thereabouts, listening to what we have to say by them doing other things, other businesses outside the cutting. Why others still see it as the question thing that they as retired nurses still have to follow. But like I said earlier on, um, change is not by, by a day, change is like something that you need to continue doing. And we continue, we will continue um, talking about the about ending of GM yeah. by the retail midwives themselves. Not midwife, but healthcare person, not just the midwife, but a medical person as in the whole. Most of the time, the midwife that do the FGM or other person do so long as a medical person they see you as a midwife. So I think we've been talking about that, doing other businesses outside your retirement stuff. And a lot of have been embracing it. Why some are still finding it difficult to do other things outside of GM. Okay, also about people that are also living in denial. You know, these are there are two categories you know, among these people. First, there are people that are doing it and they are accepting and they're even telling you there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. I think that there are different strategies to also deal with people who are doing it and they are denying. You know, those people that secretly carry out this act and then they are telling you nothing is happening. They're even coming out to campaign with you to, tell, mm -hmm. to even shout and make noise and tell everybody, this thing is bad, this thing is bad. But by the time you just enter your vehicle and go back to your city, they already have a secret office where they are, where people will have to come to yes. them. And they start coloring everything that you have done, even while they were with you. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a very big concern for the people that are living in denial. I really think that they are even more dangerous than the people that are accepting that this there's nothing wrong with it. Those of people course. you can actually know where to work with them. So what are your efforts to you know identify these people while still living in denial? 
Um, like the last community we went to, we actually have some community leaders that set up a team they call the vigilantes that go to like house to house check and all that because we realize that we as in as in, as in the person as in we we can't just go by ourselves to get this thing done trying to fish out those because we don't actually live in that community all our lives so what, what they do was that they had to set up some team some vigilantes like group to put an eye in every house if i should say so to fish out those that are still practicing fgm behind because we have them there are those who are doing it but in front of you that like nothing is really going on so those people are really doing their work and we have cases like that already and they have punishment on ground that community you understand for everybody anybody that is being caught mutilating any girl or even the woman as well okay thank you very much um gift thank you Ayo, so thank much you. so um Ayo. Um, one of the points or some of the points that your session has made me understand is that um, female genital mutilation, medicalization of FGM itself is highly rooted in poverty. And it's actually in two ways. Demand from the people and supply from the professionals or better still mm. people who have relationships with the medical mm. profession. Mm -hmm. So um, it's actually efforts from both ends. So it's not enough that we curb the efforts of supply from, from the medical professions, but also to keep working to reduce the demand from the people. Because I have worked with um, medical profession professionals who say that um, they have stopped, but people keep pressurizing them to say, carry this out for us. Them. You understand? Yeah. People still um, go to look for them. You know, there's one nurse in the community, anti-nurse, anti-nurse from there, okay, just do it, I will pay. You know, so um, it makes us understand that uh, the, the problem is actually, um, it, it, it's, it, it's a foundational problem and it's very, very, um, how do I put it? I mean, we just have to go to the roots. In as much as there are different arms we want to tackle, it still boils down to the people and their cultural beliefs. Because even my background in sociology makes me understand that regardless of how people can get um, um, educated or get some level of exposure, your social and cultural relationships and interaction, you know, um, defines the fabric of your, of, your, of your being, defines the fabric of the things you do. So um, it's not really about being um, exposed or having some level of education. It is actually in their way of life. So um, I just want to encourage every one person out there that has been working to end FGM and sees it as um, a lot of effort. Yes, it is, but we can't give up right now because we've put in so much effort. I mean, on my part, imagine seven years or more of campaigning, imagine people with 30 years, 20 years of campaigning. So all of those efforts um, needs to be celebrated and also needs to, um, needs, to, need, needs to be kept afloat. So we should not um, give up at this point. So thank you very much, Gift. Your session was very educative. I mean, I like the fact that you could also share personal stories of your engagement. So, and then um, I think you're in the middle. You, 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 you're a graduate activist and then you're also a midwife. So you have first hand information, you have primary data of what we are talking about. So um, let's just go to some of the questions we have here and see ways we can tackle them. So yeah, more of them compliments too. Wonderful pre presentation. Um, one says retired healthcare workers should be part of the ongoing awareness on the dangers of medicalization of FGM. Reorientation is very okay. Thank you very much, Theresa. Yeah, um, Raymond, my co-host had mentioned already that we work with all stakeholders. Think of them, religious leaders, traditional rulers, retired health workers, everybody to make sure that um, we end this practice. So let me search for more questions. Um, Great work here. I'm also concerned about the very rural areas where there are no professional medical personnel, but auxiliary nurses, chemists, and locally trained midwives that don't have associations of any legal bodies in charge of them. 
how do you start educating them? Where are the laws? Oh, thank you very much. This is very brilliant because yeah, I think um, sometimes midwives or traditional birth attendants are, um, I don't want to say bullied or discriminated, uh, but I think sometimes they feel left out because they don't, most people don't respect them or they don't have, um, I don't, I'm not sure if they have professional bodies. I think midwives now have now, but um, what do you think about that? Let, let, me, let me ask Dr. Zubeda, what do you think about um, some of these paramedic professionals who feel left out but have strong influence at the grassroots? Thank you very much, Ayo. Let me just say that um, every professional medical cadre has an association. What we see in the communities are quacks. They're not, they're self-taught or okay. they see other people doing it and they learn and they do the business. They're not actually, um, they probably haven't gone through any um, formal education system. So they're not associated to a regulatory body. So, you know, we have them as well. We have people that wear white coats and carry a stethoscope and they call themselves doctors, but they're not, they're quacks. So they're community members. Even healthcare workers that actually do have a regulatory system of community members, which is why the work that you do is so important. Because that grassroots engagement, whether it's through the traditional leader, whether it's through the healthcare worker, they still live in a community. So it's really, really important that the whole community, you identify the stakeholders, you identify who are the key decision makers, and then you really do your advocacy targeted to those people. Um, let me just, yes, so that's it, because really they're not, um, Association, you know, if you come, if you went through a formal medical training, then you have an association. All right, yeah. thank you very much, Dr. Zubeda. So um, that's to say that anybody rendering um, female genital mutilation service in any community can be referred to as a quack because if, you, if you're a professional and you went through the four walls of the school and you took an oath, then you should understand that female genital mutilation is, um, is wrong. actually wrong, yeah. So um, I Sorry, think- let me just um, correct you. There are professionals that are still, associated with regulatory bodies that still perform FGM. So they're not quacks. They're, okay. they're, they're so how do we label them? So how do we label them? Those are the ones conducting malpractice. Malpractice, okay. Yes. okay. So they're because they're going against the grains of they the practice. Practice. Yes. The, the quacks are the ones that did not go to any medical or health professional. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zubeda, for this. Um, so um, I will just be, um, in a few minutes, I'll be talking about um, how to join the campaign to end up jail because I see that we have lots of new people here and um, from the questions and from the comments, um, they're asking how they can join. So um, I'll be talking on behalf of GMC. So GMC is an organization that, um, support, like I said um, at the beginning, at the opening of the webinar, that what we do at GMC is to support frontline and um, ac grassroots activists in Africa. And we are operating in um, more than six countries in Africa, trying to um, um, support grassroots, which we've done to over 500 activists so far. And then um, what kind of support do we render? We have the direct action grant that we roll out about eight times in a year on um, specific international days that, um, that are related to what we champion. And we see ways we can fund activists to carry out media campaigns. We believe that the media is important in amplifying our efforts and also to um, inspire um, 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 change, you know, even at places where we cannot reach um, to those eye of their people with eye power and eye influence, you know, the media gives us access to them. So that's why we are keen on supporting media campaigners to keep working and to keep speaking up. So um, one of the ways you can start your campaign is to get trained. We'll be having master classes. You can visit our website and then um, we are preparing a whole lot of tools for even people who have no idea about what FGM is. So, once you get on our website, you can have all the details you want. And then as soon as uh, all the courses are out, you can end your certificate. I think that is still in the works. And then um, very soon you'll be able to have all the necessary information you need. So um, 
it needs to do proper research, just as Git has said. You know, there's something they call initial drag drag. You know, you just want to work, you just want to do something. Ending FGM is beyond that. It's a long-term goal. You're dealing with people, you're dealing with human life. So it is important that you are adequately equipped with knowledge. So you need to do lots of research. You need to collaborate. You don't have to champion your own project for now. You can work with one or two um, experienced grassroots advocates around you, make inquiries about them, search for them, and ask them, how can I join your organization? How can I join your campaign? So you can join them. You can learn from them, see ways they carry out their project, and think of what you can do different to solve the same problem. So after you have, you have recall or reports of projects you have carried out, you can always apply for um, grant opportunities. Currently, we have um, um, a direct action grant opportunity opened now for all activists um, to commemorate the International Day of the Girl Child, which is um, on 11th of October. So if you have brilliant ideas and you have worked to end FGM before you have carried out projects, feel free to um, to apply, particularly if you're on the WhatsApp group. So if you're willing to join us, you can also um, um, send a message um, in the chat box and we can see how we can take it up from there. So um, thank you very much. This webinar was meant to span um, two hours, but I think we did a good job with timing. <laughs> So um, we're going to take some more questions if we have, and then also the speakers will leave us with parting words. So over to you, Raymond. Raymond, are you there? Do you have questions? Are there questions on your end? So thank you so much, Ayo, for you know for that, and thank you so much to all for to all the speakers. I think they've done very very um, amazing work mm -hmm. today. Uh, it's not really about the duration. I think that they are. Um, the conversation has been quite precise uh, with a lot to take home, you know, with. Um, but then I was just looking at, um, uh, I, I just wanted to point out something. Um, what Dr. I think it was Dr. Zwer that I said that, or Dr. Costley that said that what, if FGM is practiced by a health worker, it doesn't make it right. You know, she said that FGM from a health work provider doesn't make it right. And that medicalization is becoming a trend, you know, mm -hmm. that people are beginning to migrate from analog to digital, you know, but again, considering the situation of FGM, it doesn't make it right, even if you want to go hybrid with this, because this provides very long-term consequences, either on the immediate or in a, in a very, very long time, you know, to come. Uh, but I want to ask uh, something very quickly um, to Dr. Zubaida, because, I know that UNFPA is doing an amazing work. I mean, every day trying to work out um, other ways to, to amplify support and all that. I know you people, UNFPA is not sleeping because you know people have to be in the field uh, because of what people are going through. Are there other efforts that UNFPA is making to probably uh, bring other people on board? Because I saw someone saying UNFPA should bring more people on board uh, but I know for UNFPA, it's not just about bringing people on board. It's the fact that it has to be quality people. It has to be people that are passionate about the campaign, people that should produce results with available resources. So what are the efforts of UNFPA to further you know, expand the campaign? Thank you very much. Um, I saw that question. And, um, well, we're, we're a donor organization. We also, well, well, let's say we're a funding organization because we have donors that, um, give us funds to do these activities. And when donors give you funds, they normally have strict criteria about uh -huh. um, how their funds are handled because these are normally taxpayers' money that they take to give to us. Um, so UNFPA, how we engage with partners is because we don't go out and do the work. There's no point UNFPA, we can't even go out and do the work. You know, we rely on the community, um, the grassroots, um, NGOs and CBOs and faith-based organizations that understand the nuances of the community to do the work. So there's a screening process, um, both financially and technically. And then if you qualify, then um, you can uh, apply to be our implementing partner. But our implementing partners, the grassroots, also work with a wide coalition. So you may not be a direct partner to UNFPA, but you may be a partner with one of UNFPA's um, implementing partners. So just reach out, tell us which state you're in. Um, unfortunately, we're not in a lot of states in Nigeria at the moment, 
uh, we're just in five states where the highest burden of FGM are. But even the last NDHS um, showed us that the emerging hotspots in the northern parts of the country. And we're hoping that um, the next phase of the FGM programming will allow us to do a bit more research to find out what really are the social norms that are driving these things in different parts of the country, and then we can program better. So we would be looking for more partners um, to help our work. So hope that responds to the question. All right, thank you. I'm so over to you, Ayo. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Zubeda. Thank you very much, Raymond. So um, I think I would be speaking with Dr. Cosley. But before then, I think there's some questions here. So um, someone says that um, the traditional ruler in a community said their problem is the health workers who kept telling women to carry out FGM on their daughters before they go to school. I mean, this is weird because um, in as much as we have all the stakeholders on board to end FGM, we expect that traditional rulers perhaps might be the most challenging. But now imagine a situation where a traditional oh. ruler is reporting a health professional. I mean, that's, that's, that's weird. So um, kudos to the traditional leader because I want to believe that he has... Um, he understands the fact that FGM is wrong. And uh, this is also what I talked about, the issue of pressure and supply. So we are pointing out the fact that um, these quacks, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Zubeda, are the problems in the society. So for grassroots advocates who have been carrying out a um, project, um, I want to um, ask you to please focus more on um, tackling medicalization in your coming projects. You should engage more of medical practitioners. You should visit um, hospitals, antenatal wards, and um, you know, try to. In case you're not looking in those areas, you know, it's good to engage religious leaders, traditional rulers. But in case you're not looking to those areas, please, this is the best time to um, look at those areas and see that we put this to an end. So um, I think we should um, call it a day. And um, if you have more questions, kindly follow us on all our social media pages, GMC, you know, um, on Instagram, on Twitter. Twitter has been banned in Nigeria, but I think there are some deviant citizens who have their way using one VPN to connect one VPN. I didn't say that anyway, but um, if there are um, <laughs> social media platforms, that you're very active, just type global media campaign to end up GM. You always find us there on Zoom, on Instagram, on Facebook. We have a Facebook group. We can easily grant you access to that. I mean, once you join the Facebook group, it's easy for you to um, it's easy for you to join the WhatsApp from there. So the Facebook group is there. You know, it's a kind of community where you have adequate information. So as a beginner, it is important that you go there and then also follow us on all our social media pages and you can have adequate information. And from there, you can start having um, access to funds. Um, so um, Dr. Cosley, what would you like to say? Do you have any parting words for us? Dr. Cosley, are you there? I think she's not there. Okay, so. Um, yes, I'm here, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> It's been okay. a very wonderful session. It's been an amazing conversation. I just want to say that um, from this conversation, I've noted a lot of new issues that are, um, that we need to focus on. One of it is that we need to focus on research. We need to have data. For example, we talk about retired health workers performing FGM. We need data to back this up so that we know how to properly address this. So we need to do more research. That is not just for, I mean, this is also for me. It's not just for UNFP. Yeah. It's even for grassroots advocates for you know for people working to handle them. So we need to do more research. And as much as we're doing a lot of work, we also need to look at data so that we can say, oh, this is what is happening in my community. This is what is happening in my state, and I have data to back this up, this um, um, this up. And so we know how to properly address it. Thank you very much. Once again, no form of FGM is right. Let's join hands together to end the implementation. Thank you very much. And um, talking about what you said about data, just like Dr. Zubeda said, the fact that um, you see a very little representation of number 
does not mean that it is actually small because of our population. So if you see something like 10%, don't be discouraged. Like anyway, it's just 10%. No, that 10% it's means 20 million. Hundreds, exactly millions of lives. So don't be deceived by um, small, even if it is 1%, I mean, yeah. 1% of 1 million, you know, you know what that means. So how much more considering the population of your community or your state. So please, as much as we get data, don't be discouraged by, even if it's zero point something percent, it is still yeah. somebody's life, somebody's it's mother. It's human being, yeah. A human being, yeah. So please don't be discouraged. Over to you, Dr. Zubeda. Thank you very much, Ayo. I just wanted to say thank you very much. I think they really enriched the conversation. I really learned a lot from the co-speakers. Um, so thank you very much uh, to the co-panelists. And then GMC, really, this is great. Um, as I said, you know, the more hands on deck, the better. We look forward to really collaborating because as Costly said, we have zero tolerance to any form of harmful practice. And FGM, the consequences are just unbelievable. You know, the damage it does to human lives. And, you know, even one person, as you said, one girl, one woman being cut is too many. So we really mm -hmm. continue all our efforts together. And I'm sure we can. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Zubeda. I'm so honored. I'm happy you stayed behind. It shows that really you're so passionate about, it. I mean, that's by your busy schedule and all of that. So thank you very much. We are honored to have you too. So Gifts, what do you have to say to us? Thank you, Ayo. I really enjoyed the whole presentation and all that. I think I've taken a lot of new stuff from. Um, the little I have to say is that as a medical person, your job, is to educate, it's not a chance to educate than to mutilate. No matter the pressure that comes to you, please always be at the opposite side and educate. Nobody's going to kill you. Your approach matters a lot in NDMGM. You can hear from your community leaders, you are the problem. They are no longer the problem. So you have a whole lot of work to do as a medical person in your community. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Gift. Um, this makes me remember one of the hashtags um, within the organization, my organization, in um, IGRHD, yeah. which is educate, don't mutilate. Hashtag. I mean, mutilate. if you type the hashtag, you see some of the works we've done. So um, thank you very much. So medical professionals are to enlighten, sensitize, and educate. And please, I know that um, some people get very passionate when it comes to FGM and when they go to the field, <laughs> they um, handle the case with a lot of rage and anger. Mm. You know, while you go to the communities, remember the do no harm principle. You don't go yes. there to tell them, are you high? Stop <laughs> FGM now. I'm going to want somebody today, end FGM. <laughs> so, as much as you're passionate, it is very important yeah. to conceptualize. You use the right um, kind of words, you know. Speak to people like you would like to um, be spoken to. You understand. Yes. Of respect and come up with brilliant strategies. You know, campaigning and activism is more about strategy. And um, if really you want um, good results, you know, it's more about strategy and approach. So your approach matters, um, information matters. So it is good to equip yourself with that. So thank you very much. I also want to say a very big thank you to my backup team. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. Thank you, Alice. I want to thank the entire GMC. Um, you know, I, I just want to say a very big thank you to Naima, to Maggie, to everyone you know, in the UK for this um, opportunity. It's been a privilege serving and I'm happy to do this all along. So um, thank you everyone that has joined in. Um, we'll be sharing the link to the recorded version. I think it's live on Facebook. So feel free to share. You can um, share with your friends. If you're on WhatsApp groups that encourage information like this, feel free to share the links because I want to believe um, the knowledge and the information we have shared here you know, it's going to go a very long way and I don't think it can expire while we still keep um, campaigning against FGM. So thank you very much, my co-host. Raymond, do you have anything to say? Otherwise, we call it a day. No, 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 no problem. Thank you so much uh, to GMC team and also thank you so much for having me, Ayo. Thank you very much. All right, so bye. Thank you.